Okay, so uh, if you're ready, if you're ready to do a little, little, I know it's a comedy show, it's entertainment, there's like candy, there's alcohol, but a little, yeah? Yeah? All right, we're gonna cogitate together. We are gonna fucking cogitate. You ready? Here we go. Philosophy began in ancient Greece when a man named Empedocles stuck out his hand and said, what's all this shit? He decided it was earth, air, wind, and fire. He forgot beryllium and manganese, but it was pretty good since science hadn't been invented yet. Zeno of Alia argued in one of his many paradoxes that motion is impossible since, quote, that which is in locomotion must arrive at the halfway stage before it arrives at the goal. That is, you can't ever make it from the couch to the fridge because you first have to go halfway and then halfway what's left and then halfway what's left with that, but when you constantly divide something in half, you get an answer that's very, 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 very small, but not zero, and therefore you never arrive at the fridge. <laughs> However, this view is challenged by both high school level calculus and America's staggering obesity epidemic. <laughs> In the 4th century BC, Socrates enjoyed engaging common people in debates about morality, usually by asking his opponents to define a virtue, then questioning the opponent until he contradicted himself, thus inducing aporia, an awareness of one's own ignorance. While Socrates was ultimately executed for other crimes, we can see how this might have been annoying. In the Republic, Plato said the state should be run by philosophers. That's nice, I think it should be run by comedians. That in 495 will get me a mint cookie frappuccino. Moses Maimonides, we're going a little Jewy for a minute. Moses Maimonides, in his guide for the perplex, strove to reconcile Aristotelian philosophy and science with the teachings of the Torah. Maimonides created something called negative theology, the idea that one must only attempt to describe God through negative attributes. Therefore, God doesn't exist. He is not non-existent. He's not one, but rather not plural. The point being that when God, people give God anthropomorphic qualities, they don't do justice to his greatness. Now, one viewing Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel might be tempted to disagree, but then again, a reading of God's cartoon appearances on The Simpsons might lead to the conclusion that Maimonides didn't fail to hit that not non on the nose. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas, in Summa Theological, a broad Dignagian tone covering Catholic thought, ranging from whether an angel moving from A to B passes through the points in between to whether it's ever just charged interest on loans, also pondered whether several angels could be in the same place at once, finally deciding that they cannot. He was therefore confounded when in a 13th century royal fair, 55 of them emerged, wings of flutter from a Volkswagen Jetta. Descartes said, although I doubt, I cannot doubt that I exist, thus making knowledge possible. To prove it, he gave us the XY coordinate plane. Francis Bacon established and popularized an inductive method for scientific inquiry, often called the Baconian method. The Baconian method was later improved upon by George Foreman with a substantial reduction in saturated fat. <laughs> Hobbes came along with a social contract theory that says we have to give up all of our power to the sovereign in order to be protected. Locke came along and said, no, not all of our power, just some of our power. In summary, Hobbes equals Patriot Act, Locke equals ACLU. <laughs> Bentham was a utilitarian, discarding silly old rights and justice in favor of the principle of the greatest good for the greatest number, which Bentham argued we deter determined mathematically via the hedonic calculus, for which one would pull out the old abacus and multiply the number of people experiencing the pleasure times the intensity of the pleasure times the duration of the pleasure times the frequency of the pleasure times the expectation of experiencing the pleasure again, minus the number of people experiencing pain times the intensity of the pain times the duration of the pain times the frequency of the pain times the expectation of experiencing the pain again. And if you get a positive number, it's ethical. And if you get a negative number, it isn't. <laughs> a common criticism of hedonic calculus is that it would therefore be moral to toss a Christian to the lions if enough Romans were around to enjoy watching it. Many people have no problem with this, although Bentham himself replied only insofar as to accuse his detractors of an abacus error. No? <laughs> Little mathy math thing? <laughs> Kant's categorical imperative says we should act as though willing our actions to be a universal law. In other words, if everyone can't get away with it, you can't either. The problem with this is that if we were all Marilyn Manson, society would fall apart. As long as there's only one of him, we can enjoy his music with no repercussions. <laughs> While Schopenhauer managed to be a vegetarian, opposed to slavery, and even sympathetic towards homosexuality, he nevertheless argued for the inferiority of women on all counts, and compared marriage to grasping blindfolded into a sack, hoping to find an eel out of an assembly of snakes thus leading later thinkers to accuse him of conflating his philosophy with his failed hunt for pussy. <laughs> Friedrich Nietzsche came along and argued that we should worship really strong people. It turns out Hitler liked that idea a lot, which in philosophy we call a faux pas. <laughs> Adorno in the 1950s argued that while Marxism would have been fun, the moment at which socialist revolution would have been possible in the past and that advanced capitalism would become a force so rapacious as to quash or liquidate the forces that might once have brought about its collapse. This allowed Adorno, along with all of Williamsburg, to maintain its belief in Marxism without having to do anything about it. <laughs> On another note entirely, Ayn Rand's objectivism was a philosophy touting laissez-faire capitalism, reason, individualism, hero worship, and even selfishness as a virtue. Her novel, Atlas Shrugged, portrays a world in which noble industrialists, disgusted by the estate tax, go on strike and retreat to a hidden mountain utopia while the torpid masses, aka the sniveling collectivist losers in the game of natural selection, die. 
Notably, the book's heroine and Rand's alter ego, Dagny Taggart, single-handedly runs an intercontinental railroad, makes all three of the world's most powerful men fall in love with her, and is apparently one of only two women in the entire world who deserve entry to the hidden free market utopia, thus leading to the popular series of capitalist fetish gangbang films, Atlas Jizzed. <laughs> And finally, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote that nothing has any inherent meaning, we have to make it up all for ourselves, and that was four years and $120,000 down the drain. Yeah. Yeah.